All right, so far, what did we learn from, uh, from object orientation? Okay, we learned that uh, when we are doing object oriented programming, we're going to follow certain types of, uh, um, say, um, we should be, we, we have to try to implement certain type of aspects in our programming. So our program is an object oriented program, and therefore we can actually bring order to chaos and try to organize things and um, write a computer write a computer program that uh, represents something so um, and here we are so we said that uh, to be able to do these things in a program to actually be able to actually make a program object oriented uh, we are we have to kind of bring three features in our program. The first feature was, you can always say pass if you are caught by surprise and you're like, hey, Jeremy, oh, what am I talking about? You say pass and I go to the next victim. Encapsulation is one of them. So what we do, first thing that we need to do is to encapsulate, which means, which means when we encapsulate, what do we do? Encapsulate, what do we do? Put functions in class, partially correct. We don't only put functions in class. We put something in class, that's why we call it encapsulation. To encapsulate means to put things in a package. One of them is functions. The other one, that's the second feature. We are talking about what, uh, actually, she answered the question that I had after this. Uh, so uh, encapsulation was to put, anyone? Data and behavior together, functions and data together in a package, we call that encapsulation, okay? So encapsulation was to put, uh, putting the data and behavior together. That's the first thing we need to do. Second thing is inheritance, uh, which is essentially what does it mean when we inherit something? What do we do when we inherit? So I'm doing this every time I'm coming to class. Please don't embarrass yourself, study, and you're gonna do quiz too, my lady. It says right here, but one class inherits the structure of another class. <laughs> <laughs> nice cheating, which is okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so because she cited it, she said that I'm uh, bringing your thing over here, it says getting the structure of another class. So with inheritance, we essentially reuse design. We said we have a bicycle, we want to have a motorcycle. We don't reinvent everything. We have a, we just put an engine on a bicycle and we have a motorcycle. It's ugly, but it's motorcycle. And the last feature, of the abstraction. three. Abstraction, it has nothing to do with object orientation, but it's an essential thing to do for every aspect of programming. That's the first topic that we're gonna talk after this. So we had encapsulation, we had inheritance, and? Abstraction? Say. Um, pass. No, Poly no. Polymorphism, polymorphism, to make our functions do the same thing in different ways like we do it in life. And we said airplane flies, 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 pigeon fries, and all those good stuff, they all fly. And then our friend over there brought up the concept of abstraction. Who knows when you are going to, uh, did we talk about abstraction in this class? We did, right? So we said abstraction is essentially, it, it means putting, taking all the good stuff that you want and ignore the rest. And we said without abstraction, we cannot live, we simply die. Okay, in real life, when you, you, you do abstraction all the time, as I mentioned, you don't care if I'm bald or not, as long as I teach C++ properly. You don't care if I can dance or not. I need to teach C++. That's what you need from your professor, right? So, a prof so you essentially get what you want. If, like, if you say, I wonder he can swim good properly. If you have that thought in your mind, then you're going to forget what I'm saying about C++. Therefore, you're focusing on the aspect that you're interested in, which is me teaching C++ and therefore abstraction. It happens with the exact same thing in real world. So in real world, when we are actually dealing with, uh, when we are actually uh, dealing with um, 
things that we are working. So let's say uh, this part of the class, so let's say we are all programmers working at Seneca College. And <clears throat> this part of the, uh, of the uh, class is uh, working for education, programming for the education section of Seneca. The middle part is working for security, okay? And this part works for the OSAP department. So we have OSAP department, security, and uh, education. And we are in college. You all deal with a class called student. What is a class? Class is to put the data and behavior together. We want to design a system that manages students. And that big IT department has different parts, and OSAP and security and education are three of them. Now, when education is thinking about student, what it thinks about student is if the student is late for class or not, or if the student has uh, um, passed certain thing, uh, subjects so you can take another subject, which semester is in, what is the GPA, the requirement subjects are passed, should we promote them to the next, pro promote to the next semester or not, and all those good stuff. The name of this class is a student. Are we okay with that? Then we come over here. These people want to talk about students. What do they call their class? Student, right? They say the class is student, but this student, does he have a, stu the, the, you know, does he have a student ID? Did he or she have, is vaccinated so they can get into the thing? Because that's why we scan, right? I think. Uh, whatever. So, I, uh, uh, like, if you are allowed to go to certain places, so the places that you are allowed to go to based on your student ID. If you're a student ID and you're working in the learning center, you're allowed to go be up be behind the thing. If, if you don't, then the security comes and removes and so on and so forth. So, you are thinking about those aspects. You have no care if the person paid his tuitions or not. Actually, it may, because later on, maybe OSAP department asked the security department to do it, but you really don't. It's not your, your thing, okay? You don't care which, sub, what, sub, which subjects the person passed and things like that. And when we come to OSAP, OSAP doesn't care about the rest of the stuff. All that is there is that if you have, um, if you have out, if you have, uh, uh, let's forget about OSAP and make it uh, finance. Or OSAP is better. Finance is better. So this one is finance. So the finance only cares about tuition and if you have paid your tuition or not, if you have any outstanding things or not. And um, the, 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 the financial department of Seneca still cares about which semester you're in, are you graduated or not, but they can always guess, ask the other department for that. But again, these people will call their class student too. And you know in C language if you have uh, can I have two types, two integer types, one called int for accounting and the other one int for, I don't know, uh, loop counting, counting loops, two different types of ints? You can't. Ints are ints. We have, like, can I have two different types of floats? One is to... Uh, measure the length of something only and the other one is just for money and one float has uh, many digits after the decimal points but the other float has only two we, we don't have we have one float you cannot have two different floats correct that's what the language demands types cannot get repeated a student here is type what we call the type is a compound type why is it a compound type? Because a student can be broken down into its pieces, where an integer cannot. An integer is a primitive type. You cannot break the integer into pieces. It's integer done. Character is a character. Double is a double. You cannot say double is three integers. No, double is a double with its own de definition. Right? Are we okay with this? But student can be broken down. But it's still a type. You can say student S, you create an instance out of student. As you say double D, D is an instance of double. Are we all clear on this? The problem comes over here is that doubles and primitive stuff like that, they do not need to exist in two different abstractions. We had three different abstractions over here. An abstraction of education, an abstraction of security, and an abstraction of 
finance department, three different aspects of the same thing. And based on those, the student's content is different. One is a student number, semester, subjects taken, GPA. The other one is, again, student number, name, role, uh, permitted areas. And the other one is student number, name, although they share stuff, but these one has tuitions, uh, is the person uh, uh, an, um, See, we just went out of it. Is the student, um, what do you call the people that come from outside? Yeah, international. Is the, <laughs> is the student an international student or is a local student? So depending on that tuition changes and all the things, right? But so that's the meaning of student is different with each of these people. But when you are writing, you're still writing struct student, yada, yada, yada. Security rights, structed, struct, student, yada, yada, yada. And finance rights, struct, student, yada, yada, yada. And what happens when you compile the code? It collides. Your code won't compile. The compiler is going to tell you, hey, the, the student is already defined. Why are you defining it again? How many students can you have? We can't do that, right? There is something that is uh, here uh, to help us fix it. And that's why your workshop is due on Friday. This is what we are talking about, the thing that you have to break it down. We call these namespaces. So namespaces are things that are created in C++ to give us a chance to have different abstractions of the same idea. So what happens is that the head of IT in Seneca is going to say, all people in the education department will develop their code in a namespace called EDU. So when these people are coding, an empty file for these people is a file that is surrounded in an EDU namespace. We'll look at the same facts soon. Don't think about it because everybody's thinking, how do I do it? No, again, abstraction. Think about the concept first, okay? So, and these people are security. So therefore, when, we, when they are writing, we are telling them any program you are writing, it's going to be in an, your empty file is surrounded in a namespace called SEC. Because security, right? Right? And so you are EDU, this is SEC, and this one is FIN, financial, okay? And now you start coding. When we compile your code, your student will be edu.student, your student will be sec.student, and your student is going to be fin.student. Therefore, no conflict. Got it? But these people, when they are writing a unit test, a program that tests their program, a main function, let's call it, Okay, that main function is not the EDU anymore. It's a tester program. So what they do, because they want to use the namespace, not implement it anymore. They already implement and then everything is working perfectly. Now they want to test it in an outsider function, a main application, the Seneca website, which uses all these things. They want to test it. They're not going to implement in EDU anymore. They implement in a place with no, no namespace, but over there they say, using namespace EDU. So if my main is mostly working for EDU, I'm going to write using namespace EDU. If my, therefore, I don't need to keep saying edu.student, 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 or sorry, edu scope resolution. It's not dot actually, it's scope resolution, but we'll come to it soon. Okay, so the syntax that I gave you is wrong, but don't worry. When we write it, it's going to be okay. You're going to see exactly how it works. So that's what it is. Okay, so using namespace is when you are not inside the namespace, you are not implementing a namespace, but you are using it. Therefore, in our programming, because we are students of the SDDS school, school of data science and yada, 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 that's SDDS, right? Any code you write in OOP244 will be in a namespace SDDS. How to implement it? Well, I'll demonstrate in a bit. Okay, so that's that, number one. Are we okay with that? Number two, any code that tests your program will be using namespace SDDS. 
So if I'm writing a main to test your code, it's not SDDS anymore. It's just using SDDS, okay? Or if I'm not using it, and I have only one function to call from yours, then all, all I need to do is to write SDDS scope resolution and call your function, which means the function that I want is supposed to be from this namespace. Are we good with this? All right? Okay. So, as I promised, for the first few times when I'm actually doing the class, I am going to build a project from scratch, and then after that, we're well, not going to do that anymore. I'm going to come with a prepared project that I just opened. So, starting Visual Studio. Now, I'm going to create a new project, C, C++. I want to start from empty. If it wasn't empty, I just op click, click on the name of the project that has VCXProj. Not VCXProj filters, only VCXProj. You only need two files of the entire Visual Studio shebang to carry your, your project from one computer to, a, to, to another computer. Name of the project, VCXProj. Name of the project, vcxproj.filters. The rest you can throw away. Okay? You need the solution if you have one solution with 50 projects in it. Because I will, when I'm teaching inheritance, I use that feature. I did not add that one to git ignore. So your git ignore in your op244 works repository ignores everything of Visual Studio, Studio other than those two files, because those are the only two files you need. Remember that. So, uh, and you know how I, like, if when you keep programming, you, every single project that you have creates lots of bells and whistles, megabytes of it, okay? And at the end of the, pro, at the, end of the thing, you look at your OP Works repository, you'll see, oh my God, like the valid amount of it in here is like 15 gigs, okay? I wrote programs only, but all the executables are just in there. You know what I do? I make sure that my GitHub repository and my local GitHub repository are in sync. Then I completely delete my local repository from my hard drive out of recycle bin completely empty, and I clone it again. Because my Git ignore removes all those garbage, the 15 gigs, gigs is re reduced to 15 megs because it's all text, right? No space. Okay, so every now and then you can clean up your hard drive that way. And it, it's a bless, I'm telling you. <laughs> So that, um, it helps you with that too, because uh, all the garbage is gone. Anyways, empty project, I'm gonna go next. Then, in here, I am going to use my repository that is OP244, NANZ, AA notes, but when you are doing it, you are in your, your OP244 works. Remember, you live and breathe in your OP244 works repository, and you keep committing, adding, pushing, adding, commit, push, add, commit, push, that should be, your thing to do over and over and over. So we are in NAA. I'm going to come in NAA. Is this our second thing, really? We didn't do anything last time on the computer? We didn't, did we? I don't think. Anyway, so 02. It is a third session, but it's 02. 02, January 17th. Okay, so that's uh, the date. So that's what I call it. You call this workshop two or testing. Virtuals. When I talk about virtuals, then you want to, so usually for that, I, I create a directory called Sandbox to put all the garbage in there so it doesn't go everywhere. Um, it, to be organized is very good. So, oh, wait, 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 wait. I made a mistake. So, I'm not going to write it over here. So, I'm just selecting the directory. My apologies. I'm selecting the main directory that is OP244, NAA, and ZAA. Then I'm going to go in NAS. So, that's the directory. I select the folder. And now in here, I'm going to actually create the name of the project and always make sure that this checkbox is checked. Um, you can't see, can you? You want to change it? Are you sure? <laughs> I know that he doesn't mind putting this thing over here. Sorry, because I see you, are, you keep doing. All right. Okay, so remember, not a good view. This is one of those $5 seats in the thing, you know? <laughs> and this is a $400 one running stage, you know? Eh. Anyway, <laughs> all right, so, so we create that. We'll make sure this checkbox is always checked 
for now until you understand why not. Okay, so if you uncheck that one, it creates a nested directory which is absolutely unnecessary. So never do that, okay? Always keep it checked and click create. That creates the, um, the solution for us. So let's say I want to create, wait, I don't want to. Let's say I want to uh, well, start my programming thingy. So what I will do in here, I'm going to right click on source and I'm going to add a new item that is going to be a, a, a program thingy. So I'm going to say prg.cpp. I usually do that. And as I teach, I keep renaming that prg.cpp to the concept that I was talking about. And I continue. So you're going to see all the stages of change that is happening to the code. And that helps you uh, understand how we progress. And um, so let's say I want to create a module to uh, let's say I, I want to create a module to uh, draw uh, a line on a screen. I want to draw a line. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So I want to create a module to draw a line. When you say a module res with respect to some task that you are doing, one file is for one module. Sorry, two files is one, one module, one header file, one CPP file. The header file is to introduce the functionalities of the module, and the CPP file is what the module can do, okay? Therefore, if I want to create that one, I'm going to bring up the Solution Explorer over here, and I'm going to add a header file over here called, no, item, line.h, and it's header file. Doesn't matter what you say, I, which one of these, because I'm going to change the content, but I'll do header file anyway. And then, because I want the code part of it, and I'm going to add another one, new item, and that one is going to be line. And you, you notice that line is lowercase. You will see that later on that changes. Okay? Because now I'm giving you a C example. Line is not a type, Life is, line is an action. I am draw, I'm writing a function that draws a line. I did not create an object called, called line that I could tell to object to draw yourself. Okay? That was the proper design as an object-oriented view. Well, I am, because I want to teach a few things over here, I'll start with this, and later on that line will be capitalized, and we're going to do a better job with it. So, line. And in this line, I have a thing. So you can remove that one, that pragma once thingy. You can just leave it over there or let it be. This is uh, some OP345 concept that we're going to come to, but we don't need to talk about it. So for now, just not to uh, distract you from what I want to say, I'm just going to remove it. We don't need it. So to actually start your header file, what you do is you create a, say, the, the, the compilation safeguards. And the standard for compilation sa safeguards for OOP244 is as follows, and you have to follow that for every single header file you ever write in OOP244, which is you are writing if not defined, and you do all capital SDDS, that's the name of our namespace, underline. What is the name of the file? Line. So you write line. Because we can't put dot, I'm going to put underline H. Okay? Now, I have a habit to do this, to add two underlines over here, but hey, don't. Whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as you have that pattern. Namespace, name of the header file, and separate them with underline. And don't retype this because you make have a spelling mistake, and that's going to create a very nasty bug. Uh, so we don't want that. So you just copy this, copy and paste, and just overwrite this. Uh, if not defined with defined. So this is your safeguard. Okay? And if you want to follow the rules of commenting, it's not a bad idea to have this one written over here. Which means this, so what you just see, or what, what you see over here is not C language. Although it looks like it's C language, it's not C language. It's the C compiler language. You're actually talking to the compiler, asking the compiler to compile your C in a specific way. How many people over here know what is compilation? What does it mean when I say compile? 
convert to language, but that's not the only thing. We have like the process. So I cannot convert. Can I write like my daughter's seven-year-old daughter's essay over here and compile it to C plus plus? I can. Wow, that would be awesome. So we didn't need to learn C plus plus. <laughs> she writes something about it. I don't know. One of those toys. Okay. What I mean is that compiler doesn't just do that. Compiler first checks to see if it's con convertible or not. It's going to translate it. Make sure the syntax is correct. The grammar is right. No mistake is made. And if everything is good, then yes, it actually converts it to the machine language. We talked about that. We know. Okay. So in here, I am telling to the compiler if this phrase, SDDS underline line underline H or SDDS line H, if this phrase is not defined anywhere, continue translating and compiling the code. I'm not talking about C. There is no C in here. I am telling to the compiler to continue the compilation if that thing is not defined. And then what do I do? Immediately after that, I define it. Because it's after the if statement, it doesn't care. It continues compilation. And anything I put between those two things will be compiled. And what do you do between those two things? Remember, every single thing that you do will be in the namespace SDDS. You follow? Everything you do is in the namespace SDDS. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an empty header file. So as soon as you create a header file, this is what you write with your eyes closed. Before even you can think, what am I going to do? What am I going to put in this header file? That's an empty, that's no coding. You just have an empty file now. That's the skeleton in which you can actually program. Why we write that? So if your line.header file is included more than once, it's not going to get compiled twice. The first time this is getting compiled, the compiler says, is SDDS line def defined? No. It comes in. Immediately it gets defined, right? And everything will be compiled right to the end if, and it's done. The second one compiler hits this. It says, if not defined, but it was just defined before, right? So everything in sight will be ignored afterwards, no matter how many times you compile. Every single system's header file that you have, it has that one over there. That pragma once that you saw at the top is, so this is essentially I'm saying, I, again, I'm, I'm going to bring this example again. This is, I'm saying I want uh, the burger uh, and, and fries and a drink, okay? Pragma once, it means I want combo number two. <laughs> so it does all these things right at the top. It means it will compile this code only once. So pragma once does that, okay? But don't use it. You are using this, not pragma once. I want you to get you because uh, this, this is called preprocessor directives. We call this preprocessor, or if you want to call it in a thing that we understand, it's pre-compilation directives. You are giving directives to the compiler before compilation. So what happens, all the things that as, they have hashtag at the beginning, they are actually telling the compiler what to do before you compile. For example, what does include do? Can anybody tell me actually who was, whose turn it was? We came, with, you already answered. So do you know what include does? In C, C case, like when you include a file, you say include standard and put out put header file, what does it do, do you know? Your understanding of it, it doesn't have to be perfect. It makes the library available, correct? But how does it do it? Do you know that? Encloses the library. That's perfectly correct for a person who knows what the answer is. Like you're saying, turning it correctly. But what does it mean? It encloses the library. <laughs> include I include that H. What does it do? Include a header file. What does it do? Do you know the new one? And so you all know. I see. I, I see that you all know. You can just put it in words. Let me tell you in truth what happens. You know what happens? It opens that file, gets the context of the file, 
removes the include and pastes everything over there. It's a copy and paste. Include literally. Literally. I'm not joking. Just to show you what compilation error files up oh, compilation stuff. I'm just going to save this. Uh, if I compile, I'm not going to get any error. Will, will I? Rebuild. Unresolved simple main. Yeah, because we don't have a main. Good. So see what I'm going to do in here? I'm going to create a file, uh, any file, uh, not even have it. I'm going to say add a file, new item. Let's make it a text file, whatever you say. I'm going to go text file. Okay, in here I'm going to call it uh, Google and add. So the name of the file is Google and it's not TXT by, I don't know, by mistake, I didn't want it to be TXT. In here I'm going to say, in here I'm going to say include IO stream and in here I'm going to say int main and Save it. Done. Now I'm going to create another file. And this one, I don't know. I don't want it to be CP. How can I create a file without extension? Utility, it has to be that one, sure. So in here, I'm going to say whohoo.txt. And in whohoo.txt, I'm saying std cl hello there. And I'm going to close it like that. OK, uh, return 0. And I'm going to close it like that. So this is an absolutely incorrect C program. Do we agree? And this is another, and those, the extension even is not correct. It's TXT, right? Now look at my main. In main, I'm going to say include, what was the first one? Goo.txt, and in here, I'm going to say include who.txt, who right? Oh, it says I have builder. What's the build? Is it? Oh, why didn't you tell me earlier? <laughs> you you wanted me to be embarrassed, right? Anyway, so now so now I'm gonna go back over here and compile and run it again, and build errors again. What the devil is going on? And L oh, because this is I didn't do that thing. I have to say, see, I didn't use the uh, namespace. It's asking for it. But anyways, it doesn't care. It runs it, it compiles it, and you got to get an executor that says hello there. But this is not a right program. Like, look, this is my CPP program, two includes. What it does, it just copies and pastes two half of the things, sticks it together, and that becomes a good program. So include is blind. It's not like it brings in the library. No, it doesn't. It just copies everything inside standard input output header file and paste it here. And because they wrote it beautifully, it's as if everything is provided for you. So remember, preprocessor directives happen before your program starts. Okay? It tells the compiler what to do, which in this case is bring those files and copy it over here. Like for example, define statement. You, you learned define in IPC 144, right? Right? You know what define is? Search and replace before compilation. It's like you wrote a letter to a he, and then at the end you notice, oops, it's a she. And then you say, Re change all the he's to she. You do that in Microsoft Word, right? And um, poof, it re searches and replaces. That's define. It means go through my code. Anywhere you see this word, replace it with that word. It does it blindly. It doesn't care. Okay, so these are all preprocessor directives, be aware. And we take advantage of them. So as you see this thing, I'm going to say, A, what uh, preprocessor direct, di directives are, dot CPP, okay? 
So that it's saved in that one. And I'm gonna and you know that you don't even need to have this in a like if I remove it, see it's not even in my project. I'm just gonna remove it, not delete. I'm gonna remove it. So it's there, but it's not in my project at all. Still, if I compile it, it will compile and run perfectly because the compiler finds it anyway. Okay? So you don't have to mention it as a header file anywhere. As a matter of fact, these directories that you have in here doesn't even exist on a hard drive. Your hard drive is a flat file. In 2 January 17, you have directories that is not even mentioned in here. All these directories that you in here, it's a way of organizing your file within Visual Studio itself. And those are in 02janx.vcx.filters. Those filters have these things. So in those filters, it kind of fakes directories. There is no directory. Are we good down to this point? And I would please ask you to go to OOP244Z's uh, recordings and um, listen to the first five minutes of five, ten minutes. Of, because I have a big uh, preaching done over there. Uh, the reason that students fail every semester is that you guys don't read. It's not that you don't study. You just don't read. It writes over here. If you step one, if you, something is written on the wall, you step one more, you have one more step over here and you'll die. You say, okay, boom. You don't read. Read the instructions, then do things completely to the end. It's extremely important. Okay, read the instructions. You don't read. And I'll prove it to you in the first test, midterm. Okay, in one question. And I'll show you how many people you in. And I'm going to tell you what the question is going to be. I'm go, in the question, I'm going to say, write the prototype of a function called whatever, ABC, that accepts these two arguments. And see how many of you are going to write a full function where I only ask for the prototype. One prototype. You know what the prototype is, right? Just the prototype of a function? Because you didn't read that prototype. You just saw function, that, right. OK? Read, please. And listen to those things. I essentially was putting stress on what I just told you in 10 minutes. Please do that. All right. Uh, so now let's do the line. So in this line thing, I want to write a function line. line that uh, receives a character to fill the line with. So in here, I'm going to say fill the line with. And uh, uh, integer uh, what the length is going to be. OK, so I'm going to draw a line with this character up to this length. Are we OK with this? Problem with this? We're good? OK. Now I'm going to write the body of this thing inside my line.cpp. And then, oh, my line.cpp is error file too. Anyways, who cares? So now in my line.cpp, what I do, an empty module source code always includes a header. So include line.h and namespace sdds. Remember, these guys are implementing the namespace, and main is going to use it. So your unit test for line, your unit test, test for line will start like this, include line.h, and in here is going to say using namespace stds, int main. Because you don't want to keep typing SDDS scope resolution, SDDS scope resolution. Otherwise, if I don't write this, and I want to, like, if I, I can actually write it right now. I can start write my unit test because in my line, it is telling me what the function is. So my program is not aware that the function is not implemented because all that it sees is the introduction. It's as if I told you someone at the door standing over there giving $2,000 to each student who goes over there and scratches his head. Okay, if you are all people who have no logic, your computers, you would really think that it's somebody out there doing that, right? And when you open the door, there's nobody over there, then you're going to say, error. <laughs> I can't see anyone over there. 
You believe me. So your header file's job is to introduce to main or any program what is available. It's your responsibility to actually make it available. It trusts it. So in here, I can actually write the line thingy. I can actually say over here, uh, I'm just going to write an easy one. So first, return zero. So in here, I'm going to say line, uh, say with character dash, and 50. OK? If I do this, I get an error. Because this is not in SDDS, it can't see that. We said namespaces prevent collision of types. And the functions inside a namespace are not visible outside, too. So if I want to actually use this, the line just by itself, I have to say SDDS scope resolution line. Then that, that'll be OK. I can actually compile this code now. I can right click over here and say compile. It actually compiles perfectly, and it says fantastic. It translated it, as our friend said over there, to, my apologies, to, uh, to machine code. Obviously, it's not executable because half of it is missing. It's just translated into machine code. It's not turned into an executable yet. We all, you have all seen how compilers work in, in IPC 144, right? Did I show you a diagram how the compiler, your faces look blank to me? Okay, so so I can actually I just copied the the picture that I wanted into the into the uh, 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 directory, and now I can actually go over here and add it as a resource, which will not compile. It just have it has it have it over here, so we can see what it was about. So how compilers work? The compilers actually work like seriously. OK. I thought it's going to open it. It did not. Let me open it manually. One more time. Uh, This is how compilers work. So uh, when you are writing an application, you usually have several files. So uh, anybody over here who does not uh, have a problem seeing colors? One? Everybody's OK? No. Don't look at me like that. You know that there, like, I think one out of five people, they can't see colors. So there are see shades of gray. I have to ask, because I want to say blue, red, green, and the person doesn't know which one I'm talking about, right? So that I, I needed to know. OK, so and these are the things that you tell to your profs, like any problem that you have right at the, um, let me pause this. I, maybe I shouldn't pause this. Um, students who need accommodation, sometimes they are proud, and they, they don't say anything. And they wait halfway through semester. They struggle, and at the end, says, "Let me go ask for it." If you feel you need to be accommodated in any way because of something that situation that you have, it doesn't have to be anything like physical. You may have some problem at home that is distracting you of studying, and you need more time to do stuff. Maybe you have somebody sick in the family. I don't know. If you have stuff like this, go to the student. Federation, whatever, ask them where, where I can get counseling. And over there, go ask for accommodation. And they give it to us. And I literally put it in my submitted program. So every time you are submitting, you're going to get extended time. OK? Things like that, you need to attack it like right now. Otherwise, um, it's going to be too late. OK? So if anything's preventing you of, of going through uh, parts of the class, so please. Anyway, so. Um, any, there is no pro program that is written in one file. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen, OK? Programs happen in several files. So let's say I have uh, module one, 
Okay, let's call it 1.cpp, forget about colors, 1.cpp. The second one is 2.cpp, and then we have 3.cpp over here, and then we have 4.cpp, that we have our main. So essentially, main is either our unit test, or it is actually the main application that is running. Okay, obviously, each one of these things, they have a namespace, and main is using those namespaces, but that's not important how the compiler works. When you have, in this case, four files, the command you issue to actually uh, do this, the command that you issue on Linux to actually run this will be something like, which color is not, will be something like this. So you will be writing something like, like this. So it will be something like this. So GCC, say 1.cpp, 2.cpp, 3.cpp, and main.cpp. Right? And you compile, or you type G++, okay, or whatever, okay? So I wrote GCC over there, so G++, whatever, okay? And you hit enter. And any IDE that you have on Visual Studio and stuff, when you do Control F5, behind the scene it's doing that. There is no magic. The IDE is just an application written, and underneath you have your good old compiler that you can compile things in a command line. All IDEs are like that, okay? So this is what happens behind the scene. I have one, two, three, four files that are being compiled, which means the compiler runs five applications. So if you have four files, five things should happen successfully for the compilation process to finish. Four of them are compiler, so compiler runs four times, four times completely separate from each running, as, as if you do it one by one, and at the end one program is called, it runs, it's called a linker. So compiler runs four times, one, two, three, four, and linker is run once. So compiler starts compiling 1.cpp without knowing anything exists, as I did prg.cpp. prg.cpp of mine did not know the function line doesn't exist, right? And it compiled successfully. The function call was translated, but it wasn't actually calling. We are just translating. The command of calling a function was compiled, not the function call itself. So everyone separately, individually gets compiled. And as you see, 2.cpp is used, included in 3.cpp. You see that it's compiled, right? This line that I'm writing over here, it means the header file of 3.cpp is including it, okay? And then in main, I am including 1.cpp, 2.cpp, and 3.cpp. But 3.cpp is already including 2.cpp, correct? So you have two header files over here included without even knowing. That's why you have the safeguards. The first time it compiles it, copies it and pastes it, the second time it won't do anything. Therefore, in here we are good, and in here. And because they are all separated, we don't care. Now, each one of these things will have, so 1.cpp, CPP has line.cpp in it, and main is calling it. So the function is here, and main is calling it, right? Linker's job is to make sure that the promises made are promises kept. When I tell you there's somebody over there giving you $2,000, the, the opening and the door and looking to see is actually somebody there to give you $2,000, that's linker. So Linker is telling you that the function is missing, actually. And after all these things done, the executable is created, you run it, and you see that everything is wrong, you have to reprogram again. Because this is just syntax, it has nothing to do with logic. So please, don't come to me, it compiles. My program compiles, why it's not running? Because well, I don't know what you read over there, okay? So compilation is not important, it has to run. So this is how compilers work. Are we okay with that? Now we know how the compilers work. Okay, so.
Okay, so I can close this. All right. <clears throat> so, so I write the program, I run it. But if I, if I write line more than once, and I know that I will write it more than once, I'm not going to put this STDS over here. So in here, I'm going to say using namespace STDS. So namespaces, unlike structures, you can have a structure called employee that has a name in it, right? You can have a structure called pet that has a name. Right? A pet has a name, employee has a name. When you compile these two, when an employee has a pet, it doesn't mean that the names are going to collide because they both have something called name. Why? Because they are inside two separate structures, correct? Namespace does that without the problem of collision. So if you have two namespaces with the same name, there is no conflict. They just merge and form a bigger namespace. So all five namespaces that you have all over the place, when the compiler compiles and says, oh, another namespace with the same thing, I'm going to put everything together. So they all gather together. So names, namespaces, when they are the same, they merge. Structures, when they are the same, they collide. Do we understand what I'd say? Okay. So now let's write the line thingy over here. I'm going to come in here and write the line. So in here, I'm going to say void line. And uh, in previous semester, I, I know that many profs, what the devil? Oh, because I just wrote the line, and it doesn't make sense. It's telling me what the heck. Uh, let me just write it in there. So in here, right, I'm going to say uh, character fill. And what am I doing next? Uh, oh, uh, int length. So now in here, I'm going to say, actually, uh, length. Uh, is something that is always positive. It cannot be negative, right? Unsigned. You know what is an unsigned integer? OK. This is an integer. How many digits? 0 to 9, correct? Now, if I, this is an unsigned integer. There is no negative. If I want to make this a signed integer, then one of these two has to be one of my Thumbs must, must be zero. So let's say this is zero. If this is zero, then I have minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. So with 10 fingers, I can either show from zero to nine or minus five to positive four. Do we understand this? That's exactly the same thing with all integers. So if you have an integer that can go 62,000, 64,000 from zero to 64,000, it's minus 32,000 to positive 32,000, but positives are always one smaller than negatives because the zero cannot be in the middle, right? So that's what happens. So, so if I make it unsigned, I just am enforcing the fact that, hey, length cannot be negative, so I'm putting unsigned. It means this integer is going to be not 2 billion, but 4 billion. I don't know how big a thing is. I don't know. Whatever the size of in integer is, this is twice as big because it's unsigned. Not that I want it. So I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, I can explain more, but let's do it like this just for now. Now in here, I'm going to say unsigned, right? And I want to draw a line, so I'm going to say uh, uh, draw a line. I need uh, uh, I O stream, and in here, I'm going to say using. Uh, namespace std. When the namespace was introduced to C++, they said, OK, so what about all the standard stuff that comes with C++? They say, OK, we're going to create one namespace, call it std, and everything that comes with the language, we, did, we put it in there. So the std namespace has all the standard stuff of C++ in it. Everything that comes with the language, not custom types that you make. What is a custom type? When I say custom type, what do I mean? Can you give me somebody an example? English? <laughs> a struct. A struct is a, is a, uh, a type, 
uh, type that you make, okay? Custom type. Any structure that you make is a custom type. We call it the compound type, a type that is made up of types. And I have to mention, when I'm teaching the class, I teach you as much as I can about those topics that you have in that week so you can successfully program. By no means, it's complete. This is college, not kindergarten that I go through every single thing. I'll tell you the ballpark, you have to go and study the rest of yourself. And the test is going to be on everything that you have in that note. And especially about the things I did not talk about. Okay? So you have to read those things yourself and come with questions the next time. That I read this, in that one it said this that contradicts what you're saying. Or it said this that you did not mention I didn't understand. I may miss few parts, so please remember that. Again, read, please. Okay? Thank you. So now let's write over here something to, so I'm going to say for uh, line len and uh, see out uh, fill and len minus minus. There we go. Okay, so we draw a line. So what do we do? We come over here and test our program. So I'm going to run the program, see if the line thingy works. And it draws 50 lines. Are we all good? Okay. Everybody's okay? No problem? So you mean everyone understood how that for loop works, right? I'm going to come and ask. <laughs> Everybody knows what the devil is that? It looks unfamiliar. <laughs> Yeah, so please ask. When I write crazy stuff, ask, what the hell is that? Okay, then I'll explain how the for loops work, and I'll tell you not to do that yet. Okay, if you're working at Google and everybody writes programs like that, do it. But the most important aspect of your programming is your for, for your program to be maintainable. If this program was written for a microcomputer, like a remote control for a TV, these days, remote controls of the TVs have more memory than uh, supercomputers 20 years ago. But let's say it's one of those. Like you are programming a microwave that has like 2K of RAM. They do. There are microcomputers like that that have very small. In that case, I would understand writing this program to have least amount of memory. But when you are writing, first of all, you remember what a for loop and while loop they relate with each other, how they relate with each other, right? How to implement a for loop in a while loop? What is a translation of for loop in a while loop? Do you remember that? Everybody's looking at me. Nobody says, so uh, it's the exact same thing in the other. So if I have over here four, A, B, C, and then I have over here D. The while equivalent of this one is A, while B, D and C. Correct? Right? So if I translate the for loop that I have written over here, the first one is empty, right? So nothing there. It's while, len, then in here I'm saying, and a comma, opera a comma operator sap, uh, gives you, allows you to write multiple statements in one line. Okay? And that's what I'm doing. So it's re it becomes over here, C out, fill, and len minus minus. Now it makes more sense, doesn't it? The thing was that, why the heck didn't you write it like that from the beginning? Okay? Not only that, like, I would actually prefer to see it like this. Int i, and for i set to 0, i less than len, and I plus plus, actually that is an unsigned int, not an int. And then in here I would say whatever, um, C out fill. Even better. Okay, so three different ways of writing it. This is most because these days we have lots of memory and they're all going to get optimized, compiled to the same thing anyway. None of, neither of them was faster. Writing something like this is much preferable for me as a system analyst to see my programmer doing because I can fire that programmer and three 
years later, anybody looks at this code knows what the heck happened. But if you are sick and you can't do your work, or worse than that, three years from now, you look at this yourself, you forget what you have done. So always write your program descriptive and nice and organized. If it needs optimization, you can always do it and sell the two version 2.0 ver version of your code afterwards, right? So do it properly. Always remember the KISS method, K-I-S-S. -S, you know, everybody knows what is that, right? Yeah, keep it simple, stupid. The stupid at the end is for, like, it's cursing because it's going to shoot you in the foot if you don't. It doesn't hurt anybody else. Keep it simple at all times. That simplicity helps you later on. So, comment these. Oh, I still have that bow up there. Clear. Oh, it doesn't clear. Clear. Um, I think I have to first write something and then clear all. There you go. Okay, so, so let's comment all these. And so that's my line. Life is beautiful. It works perfectly. I have nothing to worry about. Let's just collapse those and see where we are. Any questions down to this point? Okay, next thing. Use the prototype of your... At the beginning, it's lots of stuff like this. The style of your code. I tell you stuff to do. Probably you have seen something like this in previous semester. As a prototype, right? And it works perfectly, right? Worst thing to do. Because your prototype, although it tells to the computer how it works, it doesn't tell to another human being. A person sees line, care, unsigned info. I have no idea what does that do. It's a line where, what, OK? So when you are writing your, uh, function, um, argument, Names make it actually descriptive. It's not a shame to say character to to fill the line with. It's ignored anyway. Let's use that space to give somebody a message that what the heck is the first thing you are passing. So they don't have to look at your code and debug it. And length is length. It's good. So in here, I can say line length. Right? Right? Wrong. What is, called, what is wrong with this code? Yes. Stick to one style. Stick to one style. If you are using camel notation, which is capitalizing each the first one is lowercase, and you capitalize each word in it. Stick to that. Don't do underline in one. Underline, you'll see, in our, in our case, has specific meaning when the time comes. But uh, don't do that. If you are doing it, do it all the same way. If you are writing the code, actually, I shouldn't tell you this because this is one of the easiest ways to find out if somebody's cheating or not, is this. When you are writing the code, you have a signature in your writing. If you are writing a function, you have the curly bracket in front of your function. You have a curly bracket in front of your if. Some people say, no, I want to have it in the next line intended three, three, something like that, right? Keep the same signature. Keep the same style. Don't write one function in one way, another one in another way, OK? Right? And, and um, it is a very important thing, and it's a very difficult thing not to do so. If you don't do that, you cannot trace your code. Have you ever tried to walk with unequal steps? You know how difficult it is? Seriously, I, I challenge you to go around the campus once with unequal steps. Go walk like this. OK, and you're going to die. Why? Because you are not using muscle memory. Walking is muscle memory. You have to think about every step. That's very difficult. When your code doesn't follow the same style, your eyes subconsciously must search the next beginning. It doesn't jump automatically to next one. Therefore, your debugging causes headache. Who's mine mostly? Because I have to debug your code. 
please follow the same style. So when you look at, so don't tell me it's only one line, so I'm going to put the curly bracket on the same line at the beginning at the end. No, if you are indenting, do it the same way for all of them. Keep everything the same so your code flows properly and I can follow it properly and therefore we live happily ever after. Okay? Thank you. That's the beginning. I just do these things. Soon I'm going to bombard you with information. You're not going to have time to remember your own name, so don't worry about it. Next thing. Well, let's start with the uh, first thing about uh, to, to demonstrate something that is different about uh, uh, C languages that C++ language is that uh, what, uh, in C++, unlike C, you can have two functions with the same name. In C language, you could not have one function with one, two, uh, two functions with the same name. It would give you an error, right? In here, you can. I can actually have another function written, say, when I'm having a line, Say, if I just write it like this, or yeah, if I just write, write it like this, for example, it's going to be 79 characters. Because usually 80 is the line of the terminal, so I'll go 79 so the cursor doesn't jump to next. So it's kind of a big line for me to, to separate things. So say I want to do that. But it's going to give me an error. So I can actually write a new function with that. I can actually write in here in line. And in here I say void line, and I only have the first one. And I'm going to say 79 cars long. So they don't have to provide the second. And you can actually write that program exactly the same way. OK, so this is your line, the one that you had before, right? Now in here, I'm, I'm going to actually call that. And I'm going to make this one small because it's, so in here I'm going to say fill, and I'm going to say line, fill, and 79. So actually, the compiler can recognize the, 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 recognize the functions by the number of arguments and types of arguments it actually receives. So I can actually have a line like that and a line like this. Right? I can actually have something like that. And I, if I actually run the program now, you will see that the first one's going to be, uh, oh, and I actually made a boo-boo. <laughs> a bug in a one-liner program. Can you see? <laughs> My line should go to new line. I forgot to do that. So I'm going to go in line in here, and I'm going to say, go to new line, run my code one more time, and now I have two lines. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? We're good? Yes. So in C terms, they say in C language, signature of, what is a signature when you write a sign? It's something unique to identify you, right? You write a check, you, you, you sign it. You have a signature underneath. The signature of a function in C language is its name. The signature of a function in C++ is its name and its arguments. So the compiler looks at the arguments too and therefore can recognize which one to call. I'm saying line. If line is with a character and an integer, do it like this. Yeah, yeah, because it's ignored completely. Compiler doesn't give rats behind what is the name over here. All the compiler needs is the type of the first one and the type of the second one. And the type I provided is perfect. So I use the name for commenting purposes. So the person who's looking at my header file can understand what this function does. I point a little to extreme over there just to send this message that make sure the names of the arguments in your prototypes, function prototypes, are descriptive, so it's easy to understand. Many people just put over their character C and unsigned integer L. That's awful. Do that in your code. 
no problem. But in the prototype, be descriptive. Or I could do something like this event. I can actually say void line unsigned int len only length. Actually, let me not do this. Let me not do this to show you something later. Anyways, or, um, or I can actually have something like, like say void line, and I can say uh, nothing in here, just, just line. And as you see, unlike C language, we don't put void inside parentheses. No more void. And C, when you don't pass something to a function, you explicitly mention, this is void. In here, you don't mention anything. Empty means void. OK? So now in here, I can simply say, for example, void line. And if, if there is nothing in here, then it's a line with and, and that's it. OK? So now if I test this one, if I actually call the line without anything, it actually writes 79 with, with, with an assignment. Giving me an error? Gave me an error, really? Oh, no. <clears throat> OK. So that's that. Are we OK with this? All right. Now, well, let's say I want to have a line with 65, with 65 characters. So in here, I'm going to say line 65. What's going to be the output of this program? What's, what is the output of line seven? That's the question for your test, for your, for your having those, having, I'm going to say, <coughs> having these values. What is the output of line seven? Yes, yes. You just got 1% for your midterm. OK. I know you could have gotten it, but I didn't. <laughs> OK, so 1%. I do like this. But it's going to, as, as the questions go harder, I'll give you more bonus marks. So get in touch with and, and if you get once, you can't get it unless someone else gets it. OK? So you have to, you cannot get two back to back. And you have to remind me after the test. When the test is done, you get your marks. If I give me my bonus marks on this and that, then I'll give it to you. OK? And we have the recording to prove it. <laughs> so look at the date and the time. <laughs> OK, so now the thing is, yeah, so 65 is ASCII code of A. And there is no characters in C language. So at, although it looks like that I want to have uh, 65, it's going to print 79 A's. Because 79 goes to the first one. You follow what happened? Anybody know, knows what's going on? There are no characters in C language. Characters are just uh, small integers. And it fits the thing, so that's what it does. So it actually converts that one, and that's what happens. And I don't know where my visual study. Oh, that wrong one. OK, so we're good? OK? If you wanted to do something like that, you had to overload it again. So we had to actually write something like this over here. We had to write something like void line unsigned int length. You had to do this and actually implement it. And say if they actually do void line unsigned unsigned int len. Now I can actually say over here line and len. OK? Now let's see what happens. Build errors. And biggest call to overloaded function, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't know which one you want. 65 could be a character, right? 
65 could be a character. It's an ASCII code. And then you have unsigned int. Okay? So which one? Which one is going to be? And which one it can call? Let's see if I can fix it. How do you make something unsigned? You put a U after? And now it's done. So I removed the ambiguity. What I just mentioned over here, hey, this is not a, 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 an ASCII code. It's an unsigned integer. Because I gave it unsigned mark at the end, it says it is 65 is an unsigned int. So compiler says unsigned. Oh, I have an unsigned. I'll call the unsigned integer instead. Got it? So although these overloading works, but you cannot give something that matches two different criteria, compiler gets confused. Remember, all these single quotes that you see around characters is because we have bad memory. When you put single quote dash single quote, it's because we don't remember what the ASCII code of a dash is. Otherwise, we would have done that instead. The reason that single code is there is because we don't remember what the ASCII code is. Okay? Other than that, that's just an integer. This is just an integer we are passing to life. An integer less than 255. Are we good? All right. So, so I'm going to save this. I'm going to call it B, and I'm going to say overloaded line dot cpp and i'm going to put this one and i'm going to call it uh, b overloaded line dot cpp dot h and what i'm about to do over here i should have so and in here i have to write this properly so that's b overloaded line error file okay so i put this aside and we'll go back to a new concept that i want to follow and this one is going to be the overloaded line and this one is going to be the overloaded line main dot cpp Okay, so we have an access on it later on when we are when you're looking, you know exactly what I was talking about, right? So having the exact same main that I have over here, if what you are doing, if what you are doing is literally the same logic, then you don't need to overload. C will do it C. When I say C from now on, it's C, okay? So C will do it for you. We'll switch C will do it for you. Okay? C++ can do some nice stuff. So instead of creating these, I'm going to remove these. I can say, if the length is not provided, put 79. If this one is not provided, put, uh, what was it that I was printing? Oh, equal. There you go. Put, oh, there you go. Okay? So if I do this, the compiler still works perfectly with this. And I, in the line thingy, I'm not going to need these two anymore. OK? Simple and straightforward. Everything's set. So now when it's calling it, F10 starts the execution and waits for you to work. So F10 starts the execution and wait for you. F10 jumps over. Which means if I press F10, it runs the whole function without actually st uh, going to it. So, see, I'm pressing F10, poof, everything executed. You see that? Okay, and let me make this a little smaller. Uh, properties. Okay. F11 steps into, so if I press F11 now, it actually goes to the function call. And as you see, because in here the second argument was not provided, when I come over here, you see it's garbage, and it's garbage now, because there is nothing in it yet. 
But as soon as the function call is complete, they're going to get created, initialized. And I'm going to tell you something about function calls and how they're performed. But as soon as I continue it, you will see that len is now 79 and fill is now dot. Because dot was provided, but the second one was not. So it used that value and it, it completes it. If you are in a function and you know how it works, you want to get out, you don't want to walk through it, shift F11 completes the function and gets out. Shift F11, poof, it goes out. And as you see, it is completed up there. Okay? Now, if I run this one, again, because I did not provide any of them, then the first one will be 79, and the second one will be the equal sign. The assignment of sign. Shift F11 goes out. And if you ever forget that, click on debug. It tells you F11, step into. F10, step over. Shift F11, step out. F9, toggle point. So what does toggle point do? If you want to stop at certain point, run it and stop and just check that one. You can go to, uh, let's say, I, I want to stop when it's printing, so I'm going to bring it and put a toggle point here. Now, if I press F5, F5 is execute with debugging. It runs and hop, stops at that one. So if I press F5 now, it runs and stops at this, as you see. OK? So I could not put any, uh, I, for this one, I had to overload because it was a different logic. I didn't have the same uh, uh, order of arguments. So for that one, overloading was done, and for the other one, default argument values. And um, if I keep running, oh, it keeps going. So I'm going to stop it over here. And Control F5 runs everything without debugging. Here we go. And we have the program done. So for this one, we can remove these. That, that one, we have done it. We don't need this garbage in here. So make it clean and nice. Are we OK down to this point? Yes. That's just the debugging thing. And it's in, your Xcode does it too, by the way, Apple people. OK? Your Xcode does the exact same thing. But you have to find what it is. I don't know. OK? I don't know Xcode. So um, I'll, if I find out, I'm I told you I'm going to make a video of the thing for, for, the, for the Apple too whenever I have a, a couple of hours extra. But um, I'm sure that it has it. Uh, all IDEs have it. OK? Let's put it that way. So, uh, so I'm pressing F10 now. When you press F10, it means step over. But because it wants to do that, it compiles and stops at the beginning of the program, which, which, which is what, what you're saying right now. Okay? When I get to the function, if I'm interested to see what's inside the function, I should step into it, correct? But if I'm not interested, if the function works perfectly, I don't want to walk through it, I want to run the whole thing, I step over it. So if I step over, that is F10, it runs the whole thing. Step over, F10 runs over it. If I press F11, I step into it, see? It actually goes to the function and lets me walk through the function, step by step. <clears throat> okay, now I'm pressing F10, C out is not doing anything. If you install your uh, Visual Studio with the code, for, with all the resources installed, when you press F11 on C out, it will actually go inside C out and walk through that one. Let me see if it does it over here or not. So I'm going to press F11. No, it didn't. But yeah, if you have it, if, the, if, it, if it has the source code available, it actually goes through it. So you'll see how C out is implemented. Okay? Uh, I have a question, and I want an honest answer. How many of you have known this before, uh, know this before from IPC? Please, how many of you? This debugging, this debugging thing with, uh, with Visual Studio from IPC? The reason I want to know, like, is it taught or not? I'm just interested. Okay, so that's that. So uh, we have all these set. 
I have, uh, it ends at 30, uh, the class ends at what time? 35, so I have to 30. I have to go five minutes early because I'm going to be five minutes late for you. For the other class, you, I'm going to have to finish this one. The other class is on first floor, and I have five minutes to pack, go with their unpack impossibility. So I end five minutes early over here, start five minutes early, uh, late over there, and that's going to be fair for both classes. Okay, guys. I know it's very difficult to uh, call Fardad, so from now on you can call me Freddy. Okay? So if you want to call me, you can call me Freddy or Fred. I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay? Now I have a question. Did we hire a new person at Seneca named Fred or Freddy? Or is the same person as before, Fardak? It's not a joke, I'm asking. It's the same person. I don't have three teachers. I don't have a Fred, Freddy, and Fardak. They're all the same, right? So what is Fred and Freddy? What do we call those things? Those are Fardad's aliases, right? Right? Are we okay with that? C++ can do that. In C++, you can actually give new name to already existing things. So this, this thing I'm going to actually change over here. I'm going to call it uh, line main. So it's C line main dot CPP. Okay. So you can actually do something like this. You can actually say something like uh, integer A. Okay. And so this A I'm going to put over here 20. And now you can say integer reference R. And I cannot just do this. I cannot just say integer reference R. Because the compile, oh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm editing the wrong file. No, don't save it, don't save it. Sorry, I was editing the wrong file. My apologies. Excusez-moi, pardonnez-moi. And I don't need that line thingy. Oh, one thing I have to tell you. Uh, what was the name? N never, ever, 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 ever include a header file inside a header file. So don't say in here I'm going to write include IO stream because I know line.cpp is going to use it anyway. Never do that. That's an extremely important rule. You are allowed to include inside a header file only if you need it. If you have something in a header file from that one, so your header file cannot be compiled. Remember that. You are not allowed to have an unnecessary, that's called hidden logic. The person who wants to draw the line, take a look. The person who wants to draw the line only includes line.h. You know that include is a copy and paste. And I want this source code to be small. If you don't, if I, if unknowingly I include line.h and you have IO stream include over there, you know what is going to happen to this? It's going to copy the whole IO stream in here for nothing. Why? And in this case, you don't see anything happening. I remember that when I was uh, teaching open source and we were working on open source thing process, open, open source thing. We were working on open office, you know, office libre, open office. The compilation of the code, the compilation, like when you downloaded the source code and you compiled it, it would have taken 11 hours. Okay? Just imagine if that's, this is one of the reasons that happens. Because you keep, and the, 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 the project has, what, 50,000 source codes in there? And each, if you don't follow those things, every include that you are doing, you're just making your source code bigger and bigger for no reason. Okay? So includes are only allowed if they are used in a header file. So never do that. Okay? Extremely important. So... Never include unless needed in a header file. Okay, extremely important. And another thing, when you have two header files, a custom header file, 
and a system header file, system header files always come first. So IO stream comes first, then line, not the other way. And be why? Because this guy is high at the moment. I can't explain to you. It's too rich for our blood. Don't do that. Okay, always the other way. Are we okay with this? So custom header files always after system. Custom headers always after system. I call it system, but what I mean is that standard header file. Shmigalik needed. Anyway, so back in here. Um, why do I still have lightning? Okay, so didn't I change the source code for this one two seconds ago? I did, didn't I? What's going on here? Uh, didn't I just write integer A something somewhere? Did I? Ah, uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Anyway, so IO stream, and then in here, integer A. So you can say integer reference R. And that'll be wrong. You cannot have a two. Integer ref reference means alias, okay? When you create a reference, <clears throat> it means you want to give something a new name. So you cannot do it like that. References cannot be unless they are initialized. You cannot have an uninitialized reference. So in here, I have to say something like <sighs> set to A. Now, if I go in here and I write over here 20, if I say C out R, What's going to get printed over here will be 20. No, it's just IntelliSense is a little too slow. Okay, you type, and just by the time it wants to do it, you're finished. Anyways, <clears throat> right? So <clears throat> that's IntelliSense that gives you error underneath, okay? It's not the compiler. <clears throat> so R and A becomes the same. So if I actually come over here and set R to, say, 50, and I see out... A, what is the, what is the uh, output of line A, line 8? 50. It's going to print 50. So if I do that, I'm going to have 50 over there. We okay with that? Are we okay down to this point? This has a beautiful side effect. What is the side effect? The side effect is this. I can actually do stuff like this. Say, void set to hundred int r and in here I'm gonna say r is hundred okay so now in here I can say set to 100 and I put a in here okay let's call that ref okay and I run this program what is the output of line 13 What's going to be the output of line 13? What's going to be the output of line? I know, I, good that everybody's confused. I didn't want everybody to tell me 100, and I will shoot myself. So, because r over there is just an integer. So, a function call actually is this. When a function call happens, this is what happens. This is how the function call happens. Set to 100, and then in here you have int ref set to a. This is how set to 100 is called. It actually builds the integer and initializes it to the value or passing to the argument. Because I don't have a reference, this is not working. If I actually put over here a reference, then ref becomes, because the ref is created and instantiated at function call, ref becomes a new name for A. And whatever you change over there will change here. And therefore, when you run it, you'll see it actually modifies the value of the function, no more pointers. No, that's the thing. That's the thing about it. Okay, and and passing it by reference behind the scene is implemented by pointers. Like when they actually wrote it. So what is actually using is pointers, but without you knowing. But well, for you, all you need to know is that's the case. Or I can actually write a function like this. I can actually write over here void read. Say, oh no, void. Bool, Boolean is a new type. 
in uh, uh, C++ because it was, if they were sick and tired of people not understanding zero is false and everything else is true, they said, the heck with it, I'll create a Boolean now. Boolean is an integer that only accepts values of zero and one. So if you put in a Boolean 52, it becomes one. Okay, and not that still, not that 25 is not true, still it's the language. Anything other than zero is true, but if you like, use Boolean. So Boolean read and integer, I'm gonna say integer reference val. So now in here, I want to read something. C out is console output. C in is console input. I can e insert into C out and it's displayed. I can extract from C in and it actually gets it from keyboard. So in here, what I can say over here is C in into val. And C in is an extremely shy object. And I told you encapsulation. Encapsulation was that we can have actually functions inside a structure, correct? C in is of type a class called iStream, okay? C in is an instance of a class called iStream. As if you create student and you say student S, I have iStream C in. C in is an object of type iStream. It has many functions in it, like C out, okay? One of those functions is this. So if you give garbage to C in, if I say read over here and ask for your age, and you tell me 10 instead of 1, 0, T, E, N, C in cannot read it because it's an integer. And C in is a polymorph extraction. It doesn't care. Whatever you put over here, it knows what to read. You don't need to put a percent D to tell it's an integer. It knows it's an integer. Okay? So what happens over here, C in is very shy. If you give it something bad, Okay, it won't talk to you anymore, which means CM becomes disabled. You cannot do anything with it until you apologize. So now in here I can say if CN.fail, it means if the person didn't enter an, int enter an integer, first I'm going to apologize to CN. I'm going to say CN, my sincere apologies. Sorry, go back to normal. Go back to work, something like that. That does it. Now I'm going to tell to C in, because they entered some garbage and it's in keyboard, right? I'm going to tell to C in, hey, ignore everything that is coming in until you hit new line, which is the enter key. So I'm going to say C in, please ignore, say what, 100,000 characters, 100,000 characters, or new line, whichever comes in first. <laughs> OK? So C in is going to keep ignoring any garbage that is in a keyboard until it hits a backslash in. And then it stops. And now in here I'm going to say, and in here I, I can actually say Boolean ret, the return or success. And I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to make it true. And in here if somebody does something wrong, I'm going to say success is false. You are not allowed to have more than one return statement in your functions, people. Remember. And in here, I'm going to say success. Because I knew you would write return false, return true. You can't. Two return statement, automatic rejection. I don't want it. OK? Now I can actually say over here something like this. If I'm going to say over here, C out uh, your age, please. In here, I can say if read is successful inside age. In here, I'm going to say if age is greater than 19, I think, greater or equal to 19. Then I'm going to say, see out, what would you like to drink? in Seneca bar and go to new line. Conversation is going to happen later. Otherwise, over here, I've got to say, see out, get out of here. OK? Or I'm going to call the police. And <clears throat> in this else statement, I'm going to say, see out, I asked for age you. Beep. Okay. Ta-da! Now if I run the program, I actually wrote a function that actually receives an age. 
age please over here I'm gonna say 10 and it's gonna say get out of here and if I run this thing over here one more time and in here I'm gonna say 10 it's gonna say I asked for your age Beep. okay so that's that. So now I wrote a function that, I, that uses seed and C out and references and everything. It's 1034, which means I'm late. <laughs> all right. Questions, bring it to the lab. Extremely important. OK, go through all these things. I'm going to post the codes right now. So I'm going to have the code now. The uh, uh, thing, however, the recording is going to be up later. So. Sure. <laughs> no quiz this week. Quizzes start next week. Just a second. Because I'm going to write something wrong. So in here, January 17th, overloading references and ITC. Commit and push. Push. Okay, now I'm all with you. Yes. Uh, do you implement generics using overloading? Implementing what?